uh, 1 Thessalonians, if you would go to the fifth chapter, I'm going to show you some really, once again, Paul is a master of the Greek language. And what he does with the Greek language is so skillful and it is so amazing. And our context is verses 1 through 11. And if you have a study Bible, you'll find something, uh, I suppose, not too, uh, shouldn't shock you too much. But if you have a study Bible, you, it probably says something like this. Uh, chapter 5, 1 through 11, at least. Uh, that's a context, what we call a context of study. You will probably see that you have a heading there, and it should be something like the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Uh, because what he has just done, he's talked about the rapture in, verse, in the fourth chapter, verses 13 through 18, the parousia. And now he's, 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 he's introduced us under the parousia, not only the rapture, but the day of the Lord. The day of the, now the rapture is a mystery doctrine attached to the church. They, in other words, you're not going to find the rapture in the Old Testament. You'll only find it in the New Testament because it's pertinent to the church, which is the mystery between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ is the mystery of the church, not the mystery of Jesus coming into the world. That was taught in the Old Testament, but the mystery of the church. <clears throat> and so the day of the Lord is, is taught in the Old Testament and is taught with the coming of the Lord. Now, remember in the Old in the Old Testament, that would take us in study from Genesis uh, through John, through St. John. Because they all, they all have this one Bible, the Old Testament. All they have is the Old Testament. But they do have that. And the day of the Lord is connected with the coming of Christ. Now, we know that the, the day of the Lord is the second coming of Christ because he, he came the first time, but in the Old Testament, he just, they just taught the coming of Christ. And so there was confusion in the early, the, the early disciples in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the time and the epoch of the coming of Christ. Uh, they were confused about it because they, they couldn't figure out why Jesus was not promoting the millennial age. The kingdom. And Acts 1 7, if you recall from last week, they asked, the disciples asked him as he was about to board the ascension ship and go back to the, go back to heaven. They said, What's the deal here? What about what about the kingdom? And uh, I mean it, 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 this doesn't make sense to us. And uh, and, and, it, and it didn't until Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and dwelt them and began to teach them. And the first thing he had to teach them is the mystery doctrines of the church. Isn't it interesting that very few people know the doctrines of the mystery doctrines of the church? It's amazing to me. Uh, and yet that's, that's, our, that's our Bible uh, for our dispensation. And so... So what he what he he does he does here, uh, we've we've I just want to go to I want to go to verse five and then I'm going to have a word of prayer with you. I want to look at now. Remember the context is one through eleven, and the subject he's pushing is the day of the Lord. And 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 we have studied that. I'm going to pick up. I'm going to pick up at verse five. And the reason I'm picking up at verse 5 is because of the Greek structure of sentences. Between verse 5 and verse 11, there are three Greek sentences. That's not true in the New American Standard Bible. And what is interesting in, in uh, verse 5 is there's a period, there's two, there's, there's, there's a period in verse 5, after the word sons of day. Now that is in the New American Standard Bible. 
Then you have a semicolon, and verse 6, you have a period. And from that point on, the, the writer, uh, the translators, are not paying attention as much to the, the Greek punctuations as, they, as you might expect. So we, we'll explain all that to you. But So I'm going to pick up at verse 5. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. And what he's talked about in the first five verses is that you will not, if, if you're sons of light and sons of a day, then the second coming of Christ will have no effect upon your life. You will be part of that. The rapture will come first and then the day of the Lord will come. And he's talked about that in verses one through five. And he has said in verse five, in conclusion, for uh, for, uh, for you are all sons of light and sons of day, and he has been contrasting. We are not we are not sons of night nor of darkness. All right, it makes that very clear positionally. So then, now the reason I picked up verse five is because of the word "so then," and notice that it's connected to the to the Greek sentence, we are not, the beginning of a Greek sentence, we are not of night or of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. That's what our title is coming from. That we're going to do a doctrine on, be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober. That's sober-minded. Having put on the breastplate, now we're in the armor of God. Put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Remember the word hope. Elpis in the Greek language means confident expectation of. In other words, something that is actually going to have that we can be confident in. Now, do you see in, do you see in verse 8 the triad, the spiritual triad? Watch this now. And this is, really, this is one of Paul's big deals. Faith. He puts faith, hope, love, and hope, Right? You know, you remember what he said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13? What did he say? They're what? Well, let's look at it. This is probably his most famous pattern. Now, he says this a lot. He puts, he puts the triad of, of Christian virtues. This is the triad of Christian virtue. Faith, hope, and love. Paul writes a lot about that. He puts these three together a lot in his writings. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. That last verse of chapter 13. But now faith, hope, and love. Now they don't always, they're not always in the same order, but they're always there. Faith, hope, and love abide, but faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love, all right? Now, like most teachers, whatever he's teaching on is the greatest. <laughs> you know, what doctrine do you love the most? The one I'm teaching. He, the reason he put love is because that's what chapter 13 is about in connection with spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 13, that's the subject connected with how, how, how should spiritual gifts function in the body of Christ? Under love. Faith, hope, and love. But the grace of these in regard to spiritual gifts is love. See, he's that, he's, that's his mindset in context. All right? So you always watch kind of the way he, he runs these triads. Uh, back over here to Thessalonians with me. I'm just trying to show you uh, Paul. Paul
Paul slides this in there and he, and he puts it with the Christian armor, like in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, 10 through 17, put on the full armor of God. Well, he deals with the breastplate and he deals with the helmet. He just pulls them out and puts them in there, which shows angelic conflict. Well, I mean, why would I need a breastplate and a, and a helmet? Because of the angelic conflict, right? The spiritual warfare. So it's just kind of interesting the way he drops this in into the context of the day of the Lord. I mean, you, you've got to have your armor on at all times because of the, what we would say all the time until Christ returns. They would think second coming of Christ. We think rapture. For God has not destined, watch this now, for God has not destined us for raft. Who's the us? That's believers in the gospel of Christ. Has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through, the, through our Lord Jesus Christ. God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining. Now, what does he mean by that? Here's what he means. If, write this down now. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. 8 through 10. You want to include 10 in that. Obtaining salvation. <clears throat> the, our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 10, who died for us so that whether we are awake or whether we are asleep. You don't see that in the English, but it's there in the Greek. I'll show it to you later. That's one of, and the word weather is really interesting in the Greek language. Whether we are awake or whether we are asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. Okay? And uh, it is because the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. This is, this is Noah who has built the ark telling everybody that the, the, the day of the Lord is coming. Uh, for some, it will be judgment, wrath, and for others, it will be salvation, uh, safety. Those who are able to get on the ark, they are the ones who believe that Christ would come, die on a cross, be buried, and raised from the dead on the third day. And when they board the ark, they're in safety. Those who are left in the water are under the raft of God. Divine judgment that wiped out an entire civilization with the exception of eight people, four couples. So let's open with a word of prayer because we're going to need it to study why Paul is encouraging us to be alert and of sober minded. Remember that the preparation for Bible study is you can't study it in carnality. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. How do we get out of carnality back to the indwelling spiritual ministry of the Holy Spirit who lives inside my body and my body's become the temple of God? How do, what do I do? I confess my sin. By confessing my sin, it takes me back to the cross where I was saved. This time I go back to the cross for cleansing, not for my salvational needs, but for my spiritual needs to return me, to get me out of the flesh where I am promoting my own agenda in life to gratify my flesh and not God's. When I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me, 1 John 1, 9, and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So it's really important that you do this because of John 15, 26, 27 in there, when he talks about the Holy Spirit has been given to you in order to teach you and to recall the doctrine in your soul for daily living and for ministry to others. It's not your opinion that changes people's life. It's God's opinion. You've got to know the word of God. Let us pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet, I pray, as we look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 through 11, you would encourage our hearts to be fully equipped and ready for warfare in the angelic conflict until Christ returns. 
We need to put on the armor of God, the breastplate of faith and love, and the helmet of the confidence of our salvation, that we might be ministering for others to join. Because it'll be a terrible thing to be caught in the day of the Lord under the raft of God. So I pray, Father, we would be good stewards of the word of God and, and, and good, good ambassadors for Jesus Christ in our, in our, to our generation in our day of the post-Diluvian period civilization. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to look at seven things today. One of the things I want to do is I want to call your attention to some pertinent Greek information. The first thing I, I want to call your attention to is that when you start with the fifth chapter, verse 5b, in other words, remember there's a period in the middle of verse 5, agreed? Okay, that, that's even in the NAS. From verse 5b through the 11th verse, which is our context uh, for today, it goes from 1 to 11, but we're in the second half of that. There are three Greek sentences. There are three Greek sentences. I put them on your paper in the third paragraph of introduction. The Greek sentences, verses verse 5b and verse 6. Remember the second half of verse 5 and then 6. That's one Greek sentence. A second Greek sentence is 7 through 10, and a third one is 511. All right? Now, that's very important because a sentence brings you a complete idea, a thought, a complete idea. Now, that one idea, though, is always connected. That one idea of whatever one sentence is, is connected to a paragraph of ideas. We call it context. Text in context. Text in context. So you always want to be sure, as I did today, to remind you that the context is verses 1 through 11. I broke them down in two halves just because of time consideration. I mean, I just have a certain amount of time, so I can't cover it all and do it justice as Paul wrote it. So remember, I got three sentences. Now, in the, in the New American Standard, my, mine, I have a period at verse 7. I have a period at verse, at verse 8. I have a comma, nine. I have a period at 10, and I have a period at, at 11 in the New American Standard Version. I don't know about other translations. I don't know how the English, the English just does it. The translators of the English do that just to try to carry you with the con, I, certain ideas and context. Now, the, that you study that under textual criticism. Well, why would they do that? Well, they're writing English Bible. They're writing an English Bible. If you have a Greek Bible, it laid it out. It lays it out just like it was. Like myself, I study the Greek Bible on it. But the reason they did that is textual criticism. They're just trying to make sure that you're not missing any of the points, and so they put a period there because it's written in what? Written in what? English. I mean, if, if you ever went overseas and had to work with a translator, Rick, have you worked with a translator? The, I mean, it's... I mean, it's... I mean, you really have to be on top of your game because you say one thing... And then you pause, and then he talks for half an hour, and then you come back to your second idea. Um, I mean, just the, the ability to stay on cue would be enormous. But anyhow, and then that's not my, 
my, my point. But here I want to look at, now when I go through, I've got, I've got seven points with seven doctrines that, that every point doesn't have a doctrine, I don't think, but some have two and others don't. But I, So I want you to pay attention as we go through here. Remember our subject, be alert and be of sober mind. That's you and I. Point number one, the Greek language is important in our very first Greek sentence. It builds our lesson title and it encourages seven doctrinal points on be alert right out of the gate when that the writer broke made a sentence out of a verse here say one of the first things you do in the greek language is you learn when you look at the context to break it down in greek sentences first at least we teach our guys that because you really need to know where you got it. Listen, the whole idea is to get in the, in the writer's head in order to get in the head of God. I mean, I've got to get into Paul's mind in order to get into the mind of God that Paul's in. And that I have to d discern all that and bring it out into English language at times that you're not interested in any of it. Just get to the point, Pastor. Just get to the point. But sometimes getting to the point for a guy like me is kind of difficult. But out of this, in, when, when he broke that verse into two sentences and then we began another chain of, of Greek sentences, out of that, I got my lesson title, and seven doctrinal points about be alert and sober, a message to the church. Okay? Now, here's what's important in the Greek language that you're not going to pay any attention to until I point out. In verse 6, the word so then. Now, remember that the last half of verse 5 and all of verse 6 is one Greek sentence. In other words, you don't stop. You, you say, we are not of night or day, so then. And what he did in verse 5 is contrast. Paul is using metaphors and illustrations in contrast. Light and darkness, day and night. And he does it here. We are. He says, we are all sons of light and sons of, of the day. That's those who believe the gospel of Christ. We are not of the night or darkness. Why? We have been removed from that. Listen to me. Everybody starts out sons of darkness and night. I'll, I'll show it to you in the Bible. Everybody starts. You're, you're born in Adam in darkness and night. And the only way out of that spiritual darkness and night is the gospel of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day to give you a change of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. He's a new creature in Christ. And, and that's what Paul is contrasting. You once were sons of darkness and night. You believe the gospel of Christ and your position changed by the grace of God. Not by, you didn't climb out of that darkness pit. You didn't climb out on your own. Your life didn't change from darkness and night to, to light and day because of anything you did. It was everything that Christ did on that cross on your behalf. And the moment you believe it, the grace of God removes you from a position in Adam. This is part of that 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. And places you into God in Christ. Places you into God in Christ. Or you might say, from Christ into God. John 10, 28 through 30. If any man be in Christ, you see, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 
And so he contra contrasts that. He says in verse 5, for you are all, not some, all. That's positional. We are not night nor day. We are not night or darkness. So then, see the so then? The so then, look. He used two inferential particles. You don't need to do that. When you do that, when you do that, it gives a strong argument. It makes a strong, it, it's an expression of a strong point in the Greek language. I wrote on your paper just because people say, where do you get this stuff? The Greek particles are used to express hidden meanings and shadows of thought of the writer who is used in metaphors and illustrations. They are used to give clarity to the spiritual truth and the doctrinal meaning to the message the writer is giving. That's data ad mansi. That's advanced Greek. That's where you get that stuff. You get it from a study of the Greek language. And what Paul did here is just phenomenal. What he did is he used these, these two, araun, they are both, by themselves, they're important words. When you put them together, you're doing it to make a strong expression of a doctrinal idea or a spiritual truth. That's, that's how Paul used that stuff. And when Paul does that, you go like, whoa. He just used two inferential particles. And therefore, your lights go on and you realize what Paul is telling you, that what he's about to tell you now, you ne need to pay close attention. And here's what he says. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Then he goes on, for those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. That, remember, we go on because this is a, a, a new sentence. But since we are of the day, let us be sober-minded, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation, Right? And, th and then he's going to grab a hold of uh, another idea. So, here, here's what the writer, here's what the, so let me go to point two. And the reason, listen, the reason you, when you have two inferential particles, in other words, you've got separate conjunctions working, and you pu pull, push them together. These are conjunctions, you push them together. You just take two of them and push them together. It changes the dynamics of what he's about to tell you. I mean, he's trying to say, I mean, this is a guy raising his voice and making an illustration or doing whatever he does. Paul has to use the language to do it. You know, I'm up here going, like, you got to get this. Paul had to use two conjectures, push them together to, to make an inferential. I mean, it's just how he did it. I'm just telling you because my responsibility is get into head of hit, get inside Paul's head, who is the writer of this, in order to, to to understand what God's trying to tell us. Point number two. So Paul used the word "so then" in five six to make seven doctrinal points throughout the rest of our lesson text. That would be in our lesson text. 5b through 11. The greater context is 1 through 11. And what he's telling us, that what Paul is going to say, well, well, we're looking to the day of the Lord to come. We know that we have a responsibility. We are the, we are the generation that built the ark and are waiting for God to come and say, enter the ark. You understand that? We're the generation that built the ark. We're the post-Diluvian period. Our building the ark is the church. And 
And the way people get into church is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one day the church is going to be removed like the ark was, right? And we need to be getting people aboard the church because the church is about to become a UFO. Think about that. Think what they'll be talking about when they see the church go, and they air guys up there in the airplanes and jets are flying around going, whoa, you're not going to believe that. I think I saw my aunt. <laughs> if you think UFOs or something, well, you wait till the church is pulled out of here. And so what is our response? Here's Paul. So then here's what we ought to be spiritually alert and ready in the angelic conflict to fill the church up. Our job is to fill the church up. Agreed? I mean, all you can do is preach the gospel. The only way you can get into the church is through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you're not willing to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, your future is not going to be good. But if you'll believe it, your day, your, for, your, that day is going to be a rewarding day in your life when the Lord says, Okay, it's time. Let's load up and go. And the UF, there we are. And our job is to preach the gospel and invite people into the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, the church. You do it through the gospel of Christ. And then you bring them in to get them sober and cleaned up in their life and the dynamics of what Christ has done in their salvation for their Christian life and let them become the great ambassadors for Christ in the world. I mean, that's our task. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We need to fill the church up. I mean through the gospel of Christ. I'm not talking about just live bodies. I'm talking about how do I become a member of the church of Jesus Christ? You got to believe the gospel of Christ. You, and, and listen, he's going to remove you from being a child of, 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 of darkness and night to a child of light and day. You know, people go like, that's, the, the, the difference is light and day. You ever heard that? Where do you think that came from, that expression? It's one of the few things the enemy hasn't stole from us. All the other words, listen, the devil's using the dictionary against the church. All the words I used to use, I can't use anymore because people... Now they stole pride from me. They, got, they took gay and now they took pride. I mean, they're just stealing words from our life that we can't use anymore, but people don't know what we're talking about. We shouldn't let them do that. My, my, my. Well, anyhow, I vented a little bit. I feel better. I've been watching too much news, haven't I? Here's the doctrinal point. For you all, son, you are all, you ought to circle all, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not then. We are not now, nor will we ever be. Because what separates us from being sons of night and darkness to being sons of light and day is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. And when you believe it, you are moved from that position in Adam to this position in Christ. You don't do anything to deserve it. You don't do anything to keep it. It is by the grace of God. First Corinthians 15, 45 ought to be on your paper. There's a first Adam and a last Adam, and they're very important to your life. Everybody's born in the first Adam. You have to be born again to be in the last Adam. You know, you know, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 45. Listen to this. 1 John 1, 5. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. You know what we call that? Listen, in theology, we call that, th this is what we call positional truth. This is what we call positional truth. L listen to how it, he states it. God is light. 
and in him. There is no darkness at all. Now, you know, you don't have to say at all. If you say no darkness, you don't have to say at all. Right? So if you do say that, it's for emphasis, isn't it? Because there's always somebody who says, oh, I, I bet this would, would, I got an exception to the rule. And he's, he, he, ta- he puts a tail on the dog to stop all that foolishness. In God, that's positional truth. In God, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. Here's why John 10, 28 through 30 is important in your life. Because he says, at the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're put in the hands of Jesus Christ. He's your savior. He's your redeemer. And he's in the hands of God. No one. Just think about this now. The Holy Spirit's in you. You're in Christ. Christ is in God. The Trinity has you completely locked up and sealed, right? Ephesians 1.13 and 4.30, sealed unto the day of redemption. This is what we're talking about. Jesus said in John 8.12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, if you're a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, grace, salvation, you have the light of Christ. which is the light of God's life. You you know, John, the first chapter, he opens with that idea. The first five verses, he covers it. John 1, first five verses. What life is he talking? He's talking about God's life. He's talking about divine life, eternal life. He's talking about God's life, the abundant life in God. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will will not walk in darkness, but have the light of the life. Here's a second doctrinal point. You were formerly darkness. I mean, Ephesians 5, 8. You were formerly darkness. Why? Adam's sin. One of the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. Write this down. Write this on your paper. Ephesians 2. 13, uh, 12 and 13, he goes through a whole list of what you were in Adam. And he says, one of them that he says in there, and you were without God in the world. In Adam, you're without God in the world. If you die in that state, you will be without God in eternity. That's positional truth. Ephesians 2, 12 and 13. You were formerly darkness, that's without God, because God is light, and you were in darkness. See, that's the darkness he's talking about. But now, but now, because you're sons of day and light. But now, salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You should read Acts 26, 18 on your own, John 3, 19, and 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Boy, be sure to circle that one. Read that for sure. I love that, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. You need to read that one, especially. God's light 
Listen, God's light shining in darkness. God's light in us, God's light in us shining in darkness. The world's in darkness, aren't they? Just like you and I were. We, listen, we were born in it. We were born in darkness, separated from God, who is light. And as long as you stay separated from God, you'll always be in darkness, spiritual darkness. The only way, God is light. The only way you'll have light in your life, the light of life, is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, no, no man comes to the Father except through me. I'm the way, the truth, and the, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And we could add, and if you are that life in God, then you're the light of God. You're children of that light walking in darkness, right? In your home, how many people in your family that you meet with are unbelievers, or carnal believers. You know, unbelievers walk in darkness and have no choice. Christians walk in darkness and have choice. This carnality. I mean, how many people? And listen, you, 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 listen, you are why, listen, why you're still attached, the dynamics of your life to these people who doesn't seem they want to listen or don't want to hear. Listen, you still responsible when you get together to walk as children of light, right? You don't turn it off. Because, you, don't, you don't walk in darkness because they're in darkness and don't understand, right? You don't turn the switch off and become carnal like they are, or you can't go back and be unbelievable. You don't do that. And listen, you ever been in a real dark room? Or, or a cave that's dark. A little bit of light is the most phenomenal thing. You, you, you will, when, when somebody flips on a light and you're down in the bottom of a cave and you can't tell what direction anything is, and some guy flips on a light, your heart just becomes joyful. Mine did. It never dawned on me when I went on this exploring trip down into the belly of a cave that I didn't have a flashlight. It didn't dawn on me that I didn't have a flashlight until the guy turned it off and told us all to turn around in a circle a couple of times and figure our way out. Listen, there, not only did I not have a light, I didn't have enough money to pay my way out. If he'd have said, it's going to take five bucks out of every person to get out of here. I'd have been left. I didn't, I didn't even have my, I didn't have my billfold with me. I thought it might get stolen or I'd lose it or something. I left it in the car and locked the car. I didn't have any money or light. Listen, you, you're, in your family, you go like, they don't listen. I don't care. You still tell them the truth, don't you? Yeah, well, they don't like to hear it. So what? How do you know that one day they, they were willing to listen? The guy like me, I didn't want to hear, get away from me. One day I was ready and I heard it and somebody was there to tell it to me. I mean, you keep telling them. Yeah, you're building the ark, aren't you? Keep telling them the truth. Yo, man, what you building that ark for? For judgment. Point three. Now, now I'm going to make you crazy a little bit. I'm going to make you a little crazy. So I'm going to introduce this idea, and then we're going to go get a cup of coffee, and when you come back, you won't be crazy because I'm going to give you a little sugar and caffeine. But I got to tell you this because this is so important to Paul's writing. In our, from verses 5b through 11, Paul used six subjunctives to establish volitional responsibility to the doctrinal points he's giving. And I'm giving his doctrinal points to you. He used. He used three of these are 
hortatory subjunctives, they're identified by the word let us. That's a hortatory. And, it, and it, it pushes, as soon as you say let us do something, it's volitional responsibility connected. It's, a, it's called in the Greek language, you're going to find them in verses 5b through 8. And then he's going to do something really unusual. Paul is going to use three unique third class conjunction, conjunctions, subjunction, subjunctives. And he's going to identify them by the word weather. W-H-E-T-H-E-R, weather. And listen to me. He's going to do it with the Greek word E-I-T-E. That's made up of two words. It makes what we call an alternative <laughs> conditional. I know, you're getting crazy with me. An alternative conditional particle. He does six subjunctives, but he does them in the most unique manner. He separates them with two different ideas. The hortatory subjunctives is identified by let us in the, in the English. It reflects the importance of man's volition to the directive will of God that is declared in categorical Bible doctrine. In other words, whatever the subject matter is, it's calling man's volition to accountability to the directive will of God that's being stated in context. And you're going to do it in the English. They do it with the words, let us. You're going to find it in verse 5b8. For example, he's going to say, let us not. That's the word may, M-E. That's the word not. Let us not sleep as others do. That may in the front of that word makes that a prohibitive, not a command. It makes it prohibitive volitionally. Don't do that. I'm just giving you a heads up, we might say. I'm going to give you a heads up. Don't do that. Let us not sleep as others do, as, comparative particle again, as others do. And he's making a reference in the Christian uh, community to carnal, believe, believer, carnal believers who are living like unbelievers. Because when you walk in the flesh, you live like the rest of the world. What separates your walk is to walk in the spirit. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. When you walk in the flesh, you walk like the world who has to walk in it. They don't have a choice. But when you walk in it, you walk in the flesh, the sin nature, because you have a choice. You should be choosing to walk in the spirit. But every once in a while, you choose to walk in the flesh to gratify some kind of crazy need in your life. Well, why are you being angry? Well, sometimes I just have to be angry. There's not a time in your life you have to be angry. What are you trying to get from anger that you think you need to do that every once in a while to, to, to let the steam out of the pot? How do I get rid of the steam without blowing the lid off? I walk in the spirit. There's peace, love, joy, peace, you know, patience, kindness, goodness, right? Of Galatians 5, 22, 23. My, 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 people. So, when he says, let us not sleep as others do, Right? And I wrote this, you know, you should read 2 Corinthians, the uh, second chapter, verse 14 through the third chapter, verse 3. He, Paul makes a comparison between three, three people in the world. Sukikos calls it the natural man in English. The Sukikos, the soulish man, whose, whose soul and spirit is not attached to God. It is attached to his flesh and to the world. 
pneumatikos is the person who has been born again and the Holy Spirit dwells in him and the Holy Spirit has been given the responsibility to, to give you the ability by the grace of God to walk as children of light. That's a pneumatikos in the, the spiritual, a spiritual person. You've been born again to be a spiritual person and God has equipped you with everything necessary outside yourself, has now equipped you inside yourself to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit by the word of God. And every situation in your life can be conquered by walking in the spirit by the word of God, walking by faith and walking in the power of the spirit. Every problem in your life is conquered by these two. Here's my third doctrinal point. The carnal believer must awaken from the sleep of carnal apathy like the unbelievers because the night is almost gone. You know why? Because of the imminence of the return of Christ. Awaken is a choice. Now, here's what he means by awaken. Not that you woke up, but that you got up. See, you can awake and go back to sleep, can't you? Come on now. Uh, how many times you rolled over and looked at the clock and you said 4 o'clock and you got like, I ain't got, what am I going to do at 4 o'clock? No. You go to the potty and do whatever you got to do while you're, while you're awake. I might as well take advantage of it. If you're a personality, you can't just waste being woke up. <laughs> you got to do something, right? And when you get to go back, you go like, I go back to sleep. I can't get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'll be back in bed at 6, 7. See, this word awake means to be awake and get up. as opposed to sleep. Get up and do the Lord's work. Time to go to work. Time to go to school. It's time to go to work. It's time to get up. It's time, it's time, it's time. That's what he means by awake. The carnal believer must awake from the sleep of carnal apathy like the unbelievers of the world because the night is almost gone. And you should read Romans 13, 11 through 14. Boy, that's a good read. It is important for the sons of light and the sons of day to be alert and to be sober-minded. One of the interesting words that's used by Paul for the word alert is where you get the English word for the name Gary. Uh, Gregory, Gregory. Uh, it's the, the Greek word, uh, Greg Oreo. The good thing I didn't do that before I had my donut downstairs. I, I, I see Oreo in it, so I'd have been crazy. Uh, it's a military word. It's a military word. Uh, at least it's not the only way it's used. It could be used with firemen or policemen or anybody like that. But in a, in a military, uh, it. It, it would be a sentry on duty in wartime. And that would be, and, th and that's the word alert. Now, I don't know how the army is anymore, but what, when I was in, we, we, you know, we had to go, we had to do this and we had to pull uh, duty. And boy, they, they really impressed you to be alert and they pulled all kinds of schemes on you. Uh, to get you, you know, if they caught you sleeping and all that kind of stuff, you was in deep trouble. But, the, but can you imagine what it would be like to be on sentry duty in wartime? And everybody else has just come off from the front line and they're in there trying to sleep uh, to go back to the front line and somebody's got to secure the, boundar the, the boundaries. And... Uh, this is, anyhow, this is a word that's used to be alert and uh, as a sentry on duty uh, to wartime, in wartime. 
And we know that because in that, in that verse, he says, and put on uh, the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of obtaining salvation. It's not a verb, it's an adjective. That, that, that too is interesting in itself. You're not obtaining it. it. It's salvation that's still working out in your life. The obtaining of your salvation. I mean, it looks like a verb, but it's not a verb. It's an adjective. It's used to dress up the idea of salvation. And that's what Paul did. Listen to me now. This is still Paul. This is what Paul did in Ephesians 2.10. You know, we always quote around here, uh, two eight nine. Listen to 10, because this is what Paul's after. For we are his workmanship. We are his work. In the verses prior to that, he says, it's not your workmanship that gets you saved. It's God's workmanship in Christ. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would, uh, we would walk in them. And, and that obtaining salvation. Salvation is something you get. And it's something you're constantly working out. Work out your salvation in real life time. Now, God don't need, God, God doesn't need it. It's other people that need your salvation, the reality of your salvation working out in your life, affecting other people. So that, that's, that's the idea. Uh, that's the idea. When Paul says, let's put, let's, let's wear the breastplate. Look, since we, we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here was my point in point number four. It is important for the sons of light and day to be alert and sober minded as a sentry on guard duty during wartime. That's what I think Paul has in mind. He's talking about the angelic conflict and our awareness. We have got to be vigil. We've got to be alert as a sentry on duty in wartime. I gave you Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, put on the full armor of God and other passages that would benefit us in regard to that. In other words, listen, here's what, here's what he's saying. We need to be battle ready every day of our life. We need to be battle ready. Every day we, we put on the full armor of God to do warfare. Be sure that the worst enemy in this warfare is not you. You know, people say, I'm my worst enemy. You know, you're your worst enemy. Listen, you got enough to fight without fighting yourself. We've got enough to fight without fighting what's each other. We need to be battle ready. Every day we need to be battle ready. to fight in the angelic conflict over the souls of mankind that need to be saved. I mean, think how often the devil tempted Jesus to give up his weapon. He used, he used close insiders to get him to do it, didn't he? Huh? Use Peter. He said, you're a stumbling block to me. Get behind me, Satan. I mean, he is, the devil is ruthless in this warfare. You need to be aware of that. Don't, don't fight yourself and don't fight other believers that are putting on the armor of God. There's enough to fight. Fight the devil. Win, win the prize he's holding on to. The prize he's holding on to is unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. He's trying to blind their minds, the minds of the unbelieving ones, so that they would not be saved. 
That's like, that's like putting in the face of God at judgment, on judgment day, throwing it in the face of God. Well, count, see, count yours and see how many you got. Let me show you how many I got. Listen, if you don't think the numbers could be crazy, remember the Andaluvian world and the flood. Millions drowned. Eight. There's your, there's your angelic warfare. And listen, when it came to the last period of human history, where, there, where, freedom, for, where freedom rings, it is the church age. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. We live in the age of freedom. There will be no other age until we get the millennium that is even close to it. The period you and I live in. And do you not see the devil fighting freedom? Listen, in the, America has one of the great constitutions that developed off the idea of spiritual freedom and the angelic conflict. And he fights, and listen, the church is sound asleep. They don't see it. Listen, we're fighting. Listen, the, the average guy in the street knows we're fighting for our freedoms. Do we not know that? I mean, he'll, he'll break down the front door, the devil will break down the front door to get it, or he'll, he'll, he'll go through the windows. He's a thief. He'll go through the back door. He's after it. The church of Jesus Christ is the one who's really got a hold on freedom. It was for freedom. He's never said this before. It was for freedom that I've set you free. He says, let us be alert and sober-minded in verse 6. He comes back in verse 8 when he's talking about all the armor stuff. Let us be sober. And you know what he's comparing it to? Drunken stu stupor. It's interesting. He uses the word drunk twice in, the, in our passage. And he used two different Greek words for drunk. Now you can't see it in English. But he used two different Greek words. Here's, and what, here's what he meant. And he said, we got to be sober-minded. Don't get drunk on the devil's lies. Live, live with the truth of God in your soul. It'll make you free. You shall know the truth, and it'll do what? Set you free, John 8, 32. Look. Well... Two words for drunk. That's where I was. Two, two words for drunk. Two different Greek words for drunk. They're very similar because it deals with drinking alcohol. But one word that's used for drink, drunk is drinking with the idea of getting drunk. The first word is drinking with the idea it's not taking a drink. It's, it's drinking to get drunk. You understand the difference? Please tell me you know. It's the purpose. It's not just having a glass of wine or a beer or whatever. You know, I'm hot. I think I have to have a beer. That's not the point. The point, this is not what he's talking about. He's talking about the guy who drinks to get drunk. Because... He thinks that he can lose responsibility to the life that is causing him so much pain and misery. So he drinks to deaden his mind to what's going on in his life. Do you understand that? Well, please don't understand. That's why people drink, to get drunk. 
That's right, the rest of us don't. Don't do that. And listen, unless you solve that problem, you'll never solve the drinking problem. The drinking problem, that drinking to drunk. So the first word is the person who drinks to get drunk, and the other word is the drunk who has made a lifestyle from it. And so we call him a drunk, right? Because he's made a lifestyle out of that life. I was in verse 7 that says, For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. All right? They both have taken themselves out of life. One by choice and, and one, you know, both by choice. One has chosen to go to sleep, to get up and work the next day and be productive. The other person has decided to drink his way into the night so he has, doesn't have to deal with the daylight. It's just interesting. It's the way Paul, listen, that's just the way Paul was thinking. I'm just telling you the way Paul wrote it. And, and this was what was in his mind. Paul wrote, God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether, now there's a E-I-T-E, whether, that's a third class condition, whether, whether, it shows volition, whether we are awake or whether, see, it's another E-I-T-E, or whether, and he's using them as alternatives. These are alternative uh, particles. Or whether asleep. This is the key, he says. We will live together with him. Now, he uses it in this sense. He uses it positive. So that whether we are awake or whether we sleep, we will live together with him. And, and, and look, and he's talking about, listen, he's gone positive. He's gone positive with this, not negative. He's gone positive. He's dealing, listen to me now, look up here. What he's doing is the fourth chapter, verse 17, because of the we. He's not talking about you and us. Let us and you He's not talking about carnal and spiritual believers. He's coming back. He's coming back to when Christ will come back and get us. Whether we are asleep and live for Christ or whether we're uh, awake and live for Christ. The key is we, we live with Christ. Look, here's what he means. Fourth chapter, verse 17. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud. Who are them? They're the ones that are asleep, right? A euphemism for in the presence of the Lord, but without the resurrection body. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. We will both receive our resurrection bodies in the sky. They will come back. They'll get theirs first. Then we get ours right after it. This is what he's talking about in verse, he's already explained it in 17. The use of the word, listen, all of that's because of the use. He changed it from, from us and you to we, we, we. Okay? He went French. Now, here's my doctrinal point. God did not desire the believer or the unbeliever for raft. He did not destine. He did not destine the believer or the unbeliever for raft. This is not God's desire. Look, look, look. 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to eternal life. Now, some will, will wrath. Listen, God built an ark and put a preacher out there for 120 years preaching for people that judgment was coming, the raft of God was coming, and they didn't have to go through it. They could be rescued because God had an ark, a visible, a visible lesson 
that they would be safe in Christ. You got to walk through the door. I am the door. Jesus was the door. It's a, it's a volitional choice. They had 120 years. They had 120 years to sign up to take a voyage. They didn't want to take it because it involved Jesus dying on the cross for their sins, buried and raised from the dead, and they had to believe it to, be, to get aboard. You know, what I find interesting is, is Noah just kept on preaching, didn't he? Just kept on preaching. In fact, one of the tragedies in the life of Noah is when he got off the boat, he stopped preaching. And what a mess his life turned into be. God did not destine the believer or the unbeliever for wrath, but for obtaining grace salvation. I gave you passages. Point six. In 1 Thessalonians 5.10, we have our final three subjunct subjunctives attached to the word weather. The word weather, E-I-T-E, -E, is used twice. You're, in the English, it's weather or, or, weather or. Or, see the word or? In the Greek language, it's another E-I-T-E. -E. It, 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 it's been placed there specifically. Whether we are awake or whether we are asleep. And he's, he's talking about 417. We will live together with him. See, that was the whole encouraging words of the fourth chapter, verse 18. Doctrine on point. At the rapture, all church age believers, whether carnal or spiritual, will be caught up together with the Lord because of grace salvation. Isn't that something? Can't tell you how many churches don't believe that. Yeah, it don't matter whether you believe it or not. What matters is whether you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead the third day. You believe that? You're going. You're going. Because it's based on the character of God, not on the character of man. You're not saved on your own character or your own work. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, some people are going to go and they didn't think they had a chance. That's a marvelous thing. At the rapture, all church age believer, whether carnal or spiritual, we've been caught up together with the Lord because of grace salvation. If you've got phase one, you've got phase three. If you've got phase one, salvation, you've got phase three, eternity. That's a gift from God. It, salvation is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Salvation is a gift. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't earn it to get it. You can't earn it to keep it. That's why it's called grace. Let me close. In, five, in 511, this is point seven. In 1 Thessalonians 511, Paul makes his final comment on the doctrinal subject of be alert and sober-minded with two imperatives. Do you see these imperatives? Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another. The word encourage and build up are imperatives. These are commands. Therefore, as a result of everything we studied, actually, now listen to me, actually from the fourth chapter, verse 13, through the fifth chapter, verse 11. That's why he used the word, he didn't, usually it's the word O-U-N, the word therefore. It's usually in the Greek language, O-U-N, un. But this is deo. D-I-O, it's made up of two words, dia and, and uh, uh, hoita. Be, and it means because of this. Because of this, every, every, that's verses 1 through 11. That's because it's deo. Because of this, encourage one another, present active imperative. See, that's an I-M-P-V, that's an imperative. That's a command in the Greek language. Therefore, 
because of this, the whole subject of 413 through 511, which is the rapture to the second coming of Christ business, encourage one another and watch this and build one another up. That's their spiritual momentum and growth. Encourage and build up. Isn't that wonderful? Listen, this is what we've tried to be faithful in doing around here. To keep encouraging people in their faith, their walk. Just to be, be a, a source of encouragement. And the other, and, and we, we're commanded to do that. And the other is to build them up in their faith. Teach them, teach them, teach them, instruct them, encourage them, teach them. They, they, they can't walk. Listen, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. How can they walk by faith if they have never heard it? You got to teach them. They can't walk by faith without somebody show them what it means. Where does faith come from? It comes from the word of God. And listen, until it, listen, listen, the, the, there's a formula the word of God takes you to the will of God. The will of God takes you to the work of God. That's why we're still here. That's why we're still plugging, plugging along. That's why we still got our hands to the plow. There's still, you know why you have your hands to the plow? Listen to me. There's still work to be done. I'm a farm kid. I know what it means to put your hands to a plow. That means we're going to work, son. That's what that means. Here's my final point. Church age believers are commanded to encourage and to teach. See the word and? It's chi. It's adjunctive. Adjunctive. I've told you this a lot of times. This word chi in this regard, it's connecting these two things as if they're one. Encourage and teach. Encourage and teach. The believers that you have influence with. Teach, encourage and teach others in spiritual growth regarding doctrinal, especially our doctrine today, alert and sober minded because Christ is coming again. Right? Christ is coming again. Well, Remember to leave your offering on the way out. We're still doing that. Uh, and um, let's see, before I close, do, do you have any questions that I have not answered about our move? Do you have any questions? Oh, the address, uh, 4135 uh, Moody Parkway. Moody Parkway, Moody, Moody, Alabama, Moody Parkway, Parkway, is drive down 411, headed towards Odenville. If you want to zip, 35004. Yeah? Yeah, stay doctrinal studies. Yeah. Uh, I, I, until further notice. Until, I mean, you could do it either way, but what we'd rather have you stay doctrinalstudies.com until, until we actually get moved. The only time we'll be out there is July the 4th, whenever that is. Well, there you go. No wonder my family's coming in from out of town. I truly live one day at a time. If I, if I didn't have Deanna and Rhonda, I don't know what I'd do. They keep me uh, abreast of everything, even the days. Um, okay, okay. The only time we'll be out there, unless you just want to go visit or work, uh, and if you want to do any of those, you can see John. But... We'll be here through uh, June and July. But when you drive out there, you just look, it's on the left-hand side headed towards Odenville. And uh, if you need directions, why? GPS it. Right? I tell you, 
I wish I knew how to use mine. I see these kids in the car, they got phones and stuff, and they just put that, they, 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 you, you drive and I'll tell you where to go, Grandpa, and I go like, okay. Well, good marker out there, you go too far, you'll see Bethel Baptist Church, turn around and go back. Yeah, don't go that far. I knew I should have never opened that can of worms. All right, you'll find it. There's no problem. You'll find it. Just, just remember, come out there at 1030. That's next Sunday, huh? 1030. Yeah, come out. Well, you come out whenever you want to, but I need some people out there to help set up and bring your food at 1030. We're going to eat 1130, so be sure you got your food there by 1130. 1130, 1230, and then we'll play games, and then the bridge builders will be in to do a concert from 230, 330. And uh, well, let me have. Have I had prayer? So I, I stay in a state of prayer all the time. Either that or anger, right? <laughs> let me have a word of prayer. Then Rick will take us out with our pledge of flag. Our heavenly Father, we're so thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace. And I really mean that, Father. I'm not just throwing out words. I mean, the experience of your mercy, love, and grace are just phenomenal every day. Thankful, Father, for this church, for its vision, for its ministry. Pray for our missionaries on the front field. We pray, Father, for open doors. We pray for Gary Horton. I found out Rick Hughes has got health issues. I lift him before you, Father. Just encourage our hearts, Father, to be good ambassadors for Christ, to be always alert and sober-minded of the people around us because many of them need Christ. Many of them need to be encouraged. Many of them need to be taught the truths of the word of God that they might live victorious in the devil's world. Encourage our hearts, Father, to be that kind of a people. In Jesus' name, amen.